Okay, um, I'm, I'm just going to go straight into it. Um, so in this paper, I will be discussing the ways in which the late 19th century archaeologist, poet and scientist Nina Layard explores the relationship between poetry and archaeology as a way to describe the intellectual and imaginative style with, with which she engages with the past, including but not restricted to the archaeological. Nina Layard was born in 1853 in Essex. Her interest in archaeology was publicized when she moved to Ipswich in 1889. Here, Layard was responsible for excavating instrumental archaeological discoveries, most notably for her findings of an Anglo-Saxon burial in 1889 that would gain her reputation as one of the leading archaeologists during her time. Layard was a regular writer for the East Anglian Daily Times, where she wrote about her archaeological findings, and throughout her career was held prestigious positions in scientific, scientific institutions, both metropolitan and provincial. Layard was one of the first women to be admitted as fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in 1921. Um, and later, she was elected as the first woman president of the prehistoric society. When she moved to Ipswich, Layard formed a relationship with the antiquarian and writer Mary Ottram. Layard and Ottram frequently collaborated and excavated together, and Ottram contributed to Layard's discoveries by sketching and providing watercolour paintings for Layard's archaeological publications. In the broader context of my PhD thesis, I explore how Layard's poetry expressed a specific kind of sensibility to the past through her queerness, which were intertwined in her identity as an archaeologist and a poet. In 1890, Longmans and Harper's magazine published a collection of poems by Layard. When Layard came to poetry, she was already known for her contributions to archaeology, particularly for her excavations of the Anglo-Saxon relics in Ipswich, as well as for her engagements with theories of evolution and prehistory. In the same year when her poems were published, Layard delivered a lecture at the British Association of Science at Leeds, where she challenged Darwin's theories of reversions. In her lecture, Layard expresses her concerns with Darwin's arg arguments that the sudden appearance of long-lost ancestral traits may appear in an offspring, even if the trait is absent in the parent gene. Essentially, Layard questions the biological basis for this argument, and indeed, the more nuanced observations that are left out in Dar Darwin's theories of reversions. Layard asks, is it a whole organ that suddenly reappears, or a collection of cells? Instead, Layard suggests that to reach this conclusion, we have to keep pushing further and further back to even smaller biological units to try to find an explanation. And even through this process of looking further down, no biological evidence can be found. Noting that there was no evidence of genetics during this time, Layard effectively questions how such information would be stored and transmitted, and on this basis argues against any evidences of the theory of reversions of gemules to some former state or reappearance of antiquated biological forms. This, in her opinion, would imply the imperfection of humanity. <clears throat> this persistence in the in asserting the dignity of all human beings before God was a philosophy that Layard sustained in his scientific, archaeological, and poetic interrogations. Layard's lecture at the BAS would become one of her most defining public speeches and would help build her network of connections with professional scientists and archaeologists during this time. This included the scientist John Ella Taylor and the biologist Edwin Ray Lancaster, both who had significant influences not only on shaping, but bringing Layard's thinking and writing to new audiences in the press. Layard's poetry did not receive the same engagement with poetic criticisms in the same scale as the scientific work when they were first published, but reviews of her poetry in the press were wide-ranging and offered renewed insight into Layard's identity as a poet. The more local publications, such as the Suffolk Chronicle and the East Anglian Daily Times, emphasized the credibility of Layard's verses and her astuteness in weaving together both her scientific and religious underpinnings in her poetic verses. So the East Anglian, Times, uh, East Anglian Daily Times notes, Miss Nina Laird is known to many East Anglians as a field worker in various branches of archaeology and antiquary of note, and the author of a number of books and papers betraying a wide range of interests. Readers of Longman's magazine and of Harper's magazine some years ago may have also been aware that Miss Laird is a poet, but this knowledge is not widespread. The public and scientific types of mind do not always mingle, but no one can read these and deny the author's right to be termed a poet. Layard was experimental with her poetry in Longmans and constructed verses that ranged from romantic ballads, ruminations um, of nature, and explored the themes of suffering with her evangelical Anglican philosophies at the forefront of his explorations. I argue that all of these intertwining threads feed into the more intimate, the more emotionally realized dramas that the grand sweeps of imperial history can tell, and which is simultaneously explored in her longer archaeological prose. Readers who encountered Layard's poems in Longman's magazine would notice the influences of the Brownings, for example, on, on Layard's poetic style. 
Like Elizabeth Browning, who was also published in Long Men's, the form of Layard's poems embody a mode of devotion, bodying forth the spirit's worship of God. These modes of engaging with the past is exemplified in a poem called Dead Pharaoh. Composed of 19 verses, Dead Pharaoh begins with Layard declaring that the poem was written after reading two articles on the finding of Pharaoh in the archaeological century, century illustrated monthly magazine for May 1887. Part one and two of the articles in the Century Illustrated Monthly magazine called Finding Pharaoh and Pharaoh the Oppressor and Daughter in the Light of Their Monuments are published accounts of the discovery of a series of royal mummies at Deir al-Bahri, which was the site of temples and tombs located on the west bank of the Nile and the subsequent evacuation of them to the Bulak Museum in Cairo. The site became prominent in 1881 when, as the article reports, the German Egyptologist Emily Birch discovers these mummies and retells the story of the discoveries to an American reporter. Uh, so for the purpose of understanding the context of the poem, uh, it's just a short excerpt from the article um, from, um, that's basically uh, written from the reporter's point of view. Um, so as you can see, the article continues to excavate the history of the mummies discovered, providing investigative details of the origin origins of King Ramesses' ancestors, but briefly glosses over the oppressions imposed by the Egyptians over the Assyrians. I argue that Layard's poem does the work of merging both the cultural eminence of Ramesses II during this time and the religious debates it evokes, and in doing so demonstrates how intertwining poetry and archaeology can be constructive of re-evaluating biblical authority while simultaneously resisting the glorification of such colonial narratives of the ancient past. It would be useful here to point out that this poem in many ways is also influenced by Robert Browning, um, in a similar vein to Browning, Layard's Dead Pharaoh has no framing device, comprised of verses which are intensely subjective um, and consist largely of allusions to history and scripture that lends to the elusive st uh, style of the poem. Like Browning's dramatic monologues in poems such as Saul, Death in the Desert, and Rabbi Ben Ezra, which are specifically about ancient biblical, biblical characters, Layard's intent is clear from the beginning of the poem, to reinsert the hermeneutics of the biblical discourse and mesh in the retellings of King Ramesses II. Layard investigates these ways of retelling by carefully reconstructing the archaeological narratives in the press. While the articles in the Century, Century Illustrated magazine emphasize the journalist's excitement and intensely romanticized process of discovering the pharaoh, Layard's poem focuses on the story of the individual, reclaiming the authority of the subject. The tyranny of King Ramesses II is not glossed over briefly. Instead, Layard uses the voice of the Jew boy as a narrator in the poem, who describes at great length the dehumanization suffered under the rulings of these pharaohs. Um, so this is just a, a, a verse from uh, the poem, he called me a dog and spurred me from the path I scarcely more than infant sent to learn the ways and manners of the outer world beyond the kindly shelter of my home. I, a Jew boy with native prejudice to be remodeled on an English plan. He, big with all the swelling insolence of 18 wasted years, he called me dog and sulking Hebrew son. The opening verse verse emphatically conveys the resentment of the Jew boy who expresses his anger upon reduced to a Hebrew slave. These details are omitted from the articles, which largely focuses on the lineage of King Ramesses II and the imperial, imperialistic legacies of the discovery of the mummies, which is essentially pertinent in the first article. Once kings, princes and priests, monarchs, tyrants and oppressors, equal with the gods, they now appear labelled and numbered as antiquities, where all who desire may go and face them without fear. Layard effectively utilises the form of the dramatic monologue to render agency to the voice of the Jew boy and uses the form to pull away the gaze from the idealization of the pharaoh and to seek retribution for the Jew boy who has suffered the violence of an Englishman. In reading the similarities of the function of the dramatic monologue here as a model that operates in the same manner as Browning, the literary historian Herbert Tucker argues that the dramatic monologue is, in a word, anything but monological. It represents modern character as a quotient, a ratio of history and desire, a function of the division of modern mind against itself. Indeed, in fracturing this temporal and historical distance to situate the Jew boy in a moment of encounter with the pharaoh, the narrative gives space for the scriptural truth to prevail in the literary imaginary. The poem then begins with the Jew boy declaring, I, a Jew boy, with native prejudice remodeled on an English plan. Before the protagonist explores his feelings upon witnessing the pharaoh, the poem recontextualizes the history of the pharaoh by repurposing and reimagining the article. Um, so this is a second verse. Pharaoh is found, if you would see his face, take ship for Cairo, there behold the king, face upon to the light of modern day. And while I knew not for astonishment, if now indeed I dreamed, or if perchance that others spotted with me yet again, spake out the stranger boldly in the rocks of dear El Bahari, they find the kind, the great Pharaoh, the oppressor. <laughs> 
Going back to the article of the Finding Pharaoh, the writer depicts a similar scene in capturing the encounter of Pharaoh moments after it was excavated. The focus of the narrative is fixated on the archaeologist's wonder upon discovering the king in mummy form. Um, as the archaeologist recollects in the scene, um, collecting my senses, I made the best examination of them. I could by the light of my torch and at one saw that they contained the mummies of royal personages of both sexes, and yet that was not all. I shall never forget the scenes I witnessed when standing at the mouth of the shaft. I watched the strange line of helpers while they carried across the historical plain the bodies of the very kings who had constructed the temple still standing and of the very priests who had officiated them in the temple of the Hathsu nearest away from the Kune. Further, the right, the Ramesseum, where the great granite monolith lies face to the ground. The paragraph reinforces the colonial process of excavation and the centering of the journalist's effective response to the artifacts reinforces the orientalist fantasies that such narratives pushed to the fore during this time. The metaphorical po excavation in the poem, however, exemplifies Layard's intertwining of her religious and archaeological underpinnings as a Jew boy is able to, contempor to travel to contemporary times to observe the excavation of the old, old king that has been unearthed from his tomb. It demonstrates how Layard uses the archaeological imagination to disrupt the temporal space and to confront the past. In this special issue on the theory of the archaeological imagination for the Journal of Literature and Science, Martin Willis and Alex Warwick describe how using imaginative responses to archaeology, in this case the literary, are employed to extend the explanatory, or rather are brought to bear when the empirical knowledge of scientific archaeology is felt to be unable to capture the entirety of the archaeological experience. In this way, different imaginations offer an argument about the limitations of how an archaeological relic is captured in the press and in doing so lay claim for other truths of archaeological discovery. I began this paper speaking about Layard's poetic way of seeing in interrogating Darwin's theory of reversions and how invoking this way of seeing allows us to access deeper histories, histories that may have been purposefully left out in public receptions of archaeology in the 19th century. Layard's methodological and precise way of utilizing literary modes such as the subjective monologue and the literary imagination directs our attention to how elements of poetry and the form of poetry itself sheds new light of Britain's involvement in Egypt and how turning to archaeologists who perhaps excavated in more provincial sites like Nina Layard offers us ways to partake in this process of revivifying lost and silenced voices and draws our attention to the archaeological work that is at play in accessing the past to confront these issues.